Hi, everyone. My name is Brene Brown, and I am a research professor at the University of Houston, Graduate College of Social Work. I also hold a position as a research professor of management at the University of Texas at Austin um, McCombs Business School. And I have the great pleasure today of introducing your next speaker, uh, Colonel D.D.S. Halfhill, who currently serves as the Special Assistant for Public Affairs to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I have spent my entire career, um, going on 23 years, studying the experiences and emotions that make us human. Courage, vulnerability, shame, empathy, um, and many, many others, but those four are the ones I've really spent. We just actually passed 400,000 pieces of data last year. Um, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand and unlock who we are, how we show up, um, and how we lead. And I had the great pleasure of working with Colonel Haffel, um, not only on Air Force Base, and, but also training her in my work. And she gave me very strict instructions. And if you know Colonel Halfhill, you do not, um, you follow the instructions she gives you. She said, do not waste any time talking about me and the things I've accomplished or done. Talk about the importance of the work. So here's what I'll tell you. Um, probably the greatest finding of my career is that courage, courage is a collection of four skill sets that can be taught, learned, measured, and observed. And the core of courage, at the heart of courage, is the ability to be vulnerable. And, you know, I'm a fifth generation Texan, family motto, lock and load, not raised with a whole ton of vulnerability. Um, raised to believe, I think like many of us, that vulnerability is weakness, that talking about emotion, talking about how we're feeling is weakness. Um, I was raised with a healthy dose, I think like many of us, of suck it up and get her done. But as it turns out, there is no courage without vulnerability. Vulnerability has a very simple definition. It is the feeling we experience when we are in uncertainty, risk, or emotional exposure. And it's interesting because several years ago, I was working with special forces and I asked for an example of courage that did not require uncertainty, risk, or emotional exposure. And there was just quiet and a lot of hands over faces and a lot of shaking of heads until someone just said, no ma'am, three tours. There is no courage without vulnerability. And then the next week I was with the Seattle Seahawks, asked the players the same question, same answer, and we since that time, probably asked 10,000 people, give me an example of courage that didn't require uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And there just, there is no courage without vulnerability. Yet most of us are not taught how to be vulnerable and how to communicate around our emotion, how to show up for difficult conversations. We end up talking about people instead of two people. We end up blaming and shaming and finger pointing instead of doing the uncomfortable work of accountability. So Colonel Halfhill is here today to talk to you about this work. Um, I have to say, that of all the people, we probably have a couple thousand folks trained in my work that teach it. I just, there's no one that I'm more proud to convey the research, the data, the message um, of the importance of showing up with each other in human ways so we can be brave with each other in our work. There's no one that I can imagine can do that better than Colonel Dee Dee Haffel. So without any further ado. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for um, allowing me to be with you today. Um, I have to say thank you to the AFWORKS organization. Um, what amazing work to take this big conference and turn it virtual so that we all uh, have the opportunity to learn from one another. Um, I have been listening in today and I've really been struck by two comments. Um, one made by Kevin Hines when he said 
he was on the bus and all he really wanted was one person to see his pain. And then we've heard others talk about the fact that as airmen, we need to ask for help when we need it. Um, and so I wanna to talk to you a little bit today about what is that gap? Because in one, the individual just wanted someone to reach out to him. And in the other, we're asking them to reach out to us as leaders. I've been following Dr. Brown's work since probably about 2010. Um, it's incredible research, it's incredible language. And this quote right here really summarizes for me how I want to show up as a leader and the kind of my guiding light on a daily basis. And this quote is, a leader must spend a reasonable amount of time dealing with fears and feelings, or they will squander an unreasonable amount of time trying to manage ineffective or unproductive behavior. And really that speaks to not only those we lead, but ourselves as well. We have to take the time to understand, as Dr. Brown mentioned, what makes us human and how do we engage that space in ourselves and others. So rather than kind of do a PowerPoint bulletized brief today, I really wanna share that gap I was talking to you about through story. In 2017, I was the mission support group commander at Barksdale Air Force Base. And like most commanders, I was out talking to one of my squadrons. It was the communication squadron. And we were there to present them an award. And like any time you're out in a large group as a senior leader, you really want to take the opportunity to hear from the airmen and hear what they are experiencing. So after we presented the award, I said to them, does anyone have any questions? And one airman in the back raised his hand and he said, ma'am, when is the ops tempo going to go down? Because, man, we're tired. And I said, I hear you. Like, we've been at war for nearly two decades. Um, we have a high deployment rate when we're not deployed. We're back home. We're training. We're getting just getting the business done of running a base that has 15,000 people, two headquarters. Like, we ask a lot of our airmen. I said, you know, also I had just come from Air Mobility Command where I had the opportunity to sit in on the presentations wing commanders were making to the four star. And so often I heard the same thing. We're asking so much of our airmen and they're tired. And so I asked them, you know, in that moment, how many of you are tired? And the whole group raised their hand. Well, as fate would have it, three days earlier, I had been reading an article in Harvard Business Review. And this article was talking about ops tempo and exhaustion. And it talked about a company that was going into five different organizations. And it was trying to understand why these particular organizations were reporting such high levels of exhaustion. And after spending months with these companies and talking to their employees, what they found was not just that people were tired, but that they were lonely. And that loneliness was manifesting itself in a feeling of exhaustion. So I decided in that moment to take a chance. And so I asked the group, maybe somewhat hypothetically, if I were to ask you today, instead of who's tired, who's lonely, how many of you would raise your hands? And while I wasn't expecting it, out of the group of about 30, 35, at least 15 raised their hands. And I stood there for a moment, not quite sure what to do because I don't consider myself a loneliness expert. But I was also a little bit heartbroken because see, as we've heard so many people talk about today, our Air Force is dealing with a really heavy problem of suicide within our ranks. And we spend so much time as leaders trying to understand why this is happening and how we engage and how we get our airmen to talk to us and to speak up when they need help. And so I kind of stood there for a moment, a little stunned because see, when as a leader, if I ask you if you're tired and you say yes, I'm probably gonna tell you to go get some rest. But what if what's really going on is you're lonely and I send you away? 
I'm potentially exacerbating the very problem we are trying to, to address. I've sent you away. Now there's a time and place to send our airmen to those who can get help, to those people who are trained in the mental health professionals. But like Kevin said, sometimes they just wanna know that one person cares. And we as leaders have to know how to do that. I certainly didn't ever think I would be talking about loneliness. As I said, I'm certainly not a loneliness guru. And looking back, it took a lot of courage for me to even step into that arena, but even more so, it took a ton of courage for the people in that moment to raise their hands. And then we could stop and we could have a conversation about why this was happening and why people felt the way they felt. I tell this story everywhere I can because I think it's so important as leaders to understand sometimes it's as simple as a different word choice. Sometimes it's as simple as using a word like loneliness versus tired. I was out talking and I had another commander come up to me and she says, ma'am, I talk to my airmen all the time about being disconnected. And I said, disconnected? That feels like such a sterile word. Like what is our resistance to using something like loneliness? Because when we can use the language and we can use the word, we show people that we understand as leaders the rawness of that experience, the rawness of what that feels like, and sometimes the rawness of just being human. But we don't, we stay with safe words like disconnected or isolated versus really using a language that allows us to connect. And why? Why do we do that? What gets in our way? And sometimes I think it's just a lack of practice with the language. Humanness, you heard Brene mention it. We've heard it several times today that we have to understand how to engage leaders or how to engage our airmen from a place of humanness. So in 2014, I was going to my SDE program and I was writing a paper on leadership. And as part of my research, I thought it best to explore the Air Force's most current manual on leadership, AFDD 1-1. That document was written in 2011. And as I was going through AFDD 1-1, it talked about our core values, service before self, excellence in all we do and integrity. But it talked about how these three core values were an evolution of these seven leadership traits that were in our very first manual on leadership written in 1948, AFM 35-15. And as I was looking at these seven leadership traits, one of them was humanness. And I was struck by that word, like, I'd been watching, um, I'd been you know, exploring Dr. Brown's work. I was going through several programs on my own about coaching and how we engage people differently. And so this word humanness as a leadership characteristic in our very first manual jumped out at me like a spotlight. And I thought, I have to read this manual. So I went and found AFM 35-15 and started reading it. And as I was reading it, I was struck by how much I was feeling. And that was odd for me because I certainly didn't have that feeling when I was reading AFDD 1-1. So I decided to do a word search. And the first word in AFM 35-15, again, written in 1948, that jumped, out to, that jumped out at me was feel or feeling. You have to understand how your men will feel. You have to understand the feelings they're having coming out of combat. That was in there 147 times. The second word, confidence. You must have confidence. Your men must have confidence. You must have confidence in your men 129 times. Fear, understand the fear they will have. Remember, this was 1948. This was right after World War II. These men knew fear. That was in there 35 times. To belong. As a leader, you need to create a sense of belonging. Your men will want to belong. They need to belong. They need to know they belong. Was in there 21 times. Kindness and mercy. Please be kind to your men. Have mercy on your men. 
12 times. Self-confidence. She's kind of a badass. I love it. 11 times. Friendly. Be friendly with your men. Six times. Forgive. Forgive them when they make mistakes. Teach them to forgive one another. Three times. Shame. They're going to have shame when they make mistakes. We're all going to feel shame when we don't measure up. Two times in 1948. Admired. Admire. You want to be admired. Twice. And love. How many times do you think love was mentioned in an Air Force manual on leadership in 1948? 13 times. And so I thought, well, to be fair, I should probably go back to AFDD 1-1 because maybe I just wasn't reading it closely enough the first time. And so I started to do the same search. Words like fear and feeling. One time. Confidence, four times. Fear, four times. I need to add in here that confidence and fear were both in there four times as a subset design element pulled as a pulled quote from the very first document. To belong, one time. Kindness and mercy, zero. Self-confidence, zero. Friendly, zero. You can see where this is going. Shame, zero. Forgiveness, zero. Admired, zero. And love in our AFDD 1-1, written in 2011, zero. Now, just so I wouldn't be accused of being a feeling wonk, I decided to also do a search for the word mission. And that was in there 186 versus 107 times. Now, in AFDD 1-1, it talked about tactical leadership, operational leadership, strategic leadership, but never did it talk to us about being human and understanding the personal experience of what our airmen are going through. And so that takes me back to this quote, a leader must spend a reasonable amount of time attending to fears and feelings, or they will squander an unreasonable amount of time trying to manage ineffective or unproductive behavior. That is what we are doing today. And if we as leaders can understand that by just doing a simple shift in our language, and using words that actually talk to the human experience, empathy and kindness and compassion and courage and bravery. If we can use the words forgiveness and loneliness and shame, we have got to start talking about shame if we are ever going to be able to address this idea of suicide and help our people not feel shame for asking for help. You know, Kevin said he wanted one person to see the pain he was in, but so many of us don't step forward when we ourselves need that help because we feel shame for needing it. We've got to change our language. I don't have enough time today to tell us how to do it, but we've got to take it one small step at a time. And if we do so, we can teach people that feelings are not weakness and that to be courageous means we have to step into vulnerability first. And more than anything, we can get back to the business of being human. Thank you so much for having me today.